Barton has deep roots in Maine. He made an unsuccessful run for Congress here, served as head of the state Democratic Party, and ran a marketing and consulting firm in Portland. Then he turned to diplomacy and ended his career as the first person to serve as Assistant Secretary of State for Conflict and Stabilization Operations, a job, a job rather, where the problems were so difficult that the solutions were never simple. Rick Barton has written a book about where and why American intervention in other countries has both succeeded and failed. The book is called Peace Works, America's Unifying Role in a Turbulent World. We talked about what he did at the State Department and why it was so challenging. Our job was really to go to the hottest spots in the world, places where traditional diplomacy maybe was not taking hold, and to see if we can go from policy to practice, because so oftentimes people have big ideas, but they might as well be editorials in the local paper. Um, and we wanted to see if we could actually take some of these ideas and turn them into practice where we would mobilize local people on their own behalf rather than the United States taking over the problem. You knew from the start, going into this job, and it became apparent with each new project that you took on, this is not an easy job. This, uh, in baseball terms, if you're even batting 300, you're probably doing pretty well, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I am a baseball fan, but I had a boss who, who described this work as venture capital. So if you succeed on one or two or three out of 10, you will have made such a difference to humanity and to the state of peace in the world that you should be very happy with that. You cannot possibly succeed on, on a higher percentage than that. So modesty and humility is a big part of this, uh, of this kind of work. You write in the book, um, the United States has the resources to do nearly anything to try to wait, make the world more peaceful. Yet our record in the last 25 years, Rwanda, Bosnia, Somalia, Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, and Syria, is a powerful argument for humility. Why did you say that? Well, because I think sometimes when you are the biggest and the strongest and you have all of the advantages that the United States has, you tend to think you can solve other people's problems. But most of us, even if we're asked by a close relative to help solve their problem, if they're not deeply committed to it, if they're not fully engaged with it, the likely value of our contribution is small. So why should it be any easier in a place that's at war where people are killing each other? And so I just wanted to make sure that we were starting from a place where we recognize that we could do good and we need to do good. And if we do good, we'll be respected by many, many more people in the world. But we should not be arrogant about how we go about it. I think it's fair to say that a lot of American citizens have lost confidence in the US government's ability to have an impact in many conflicts overseas. They look at the record in Iraq, they look at the record in Afghanistan, they look at the record right now in Syria, and they just kind of shake their heads and they say, why are we even there? What would you say to those folks? Well, I think many of those questions are correct. I do think that the, that the skepticism of the public is really healthy. On the other hand, we can make a difference, in particular if we invest in the local people, and we're catalytic in our assistance. We don't think we're coming in and we will s solve the problem by staying there for 10 or 20 years as we've almost done in Afghanistan. It's pretty apparent that the foreign policy of the current administration is one that relies less on allies, more of a go it alone approach for the United States in dealing with international problems. Is that wise? I, I think it's uh, ultimately it's going to be very, very costly to the United States that having friends and having other people who care about the same problems we do is a much better way to solve them because we don't have all the answers. How do you stay optimistic because you are an optimist? <laughs> Despite the fact that we have all of this terrifying uh, uh, violence in various parts of the world, it's actually a much less violent time today than it was in the 20th century when almost 100 million people died in big, big, big wars. We have a lot of violence taking place and it's unpredictable and that puts people on edge. But I do think that our trend line is essentially one that's more peaceful. You end the book with a personal anecdote and it's a pretty encouraging one in a book that has a lot of bleakness in it. <laughs> 1999, you were in West Africa. You were working uh, with the United Nations on refugee issues, and you're in an area where there were thousands of refugees. You arrived. There were hundreds and hundreds of people who had lined the roads. And they all cheered for you when you got there. Later in the day, you had an, an encounter 
with a young woman who had just given birth to triplets. What did she say to you? She had two little girls and a little boy, and she said, I've, I've, named, I've named the little boy Bart. So it was, it was a mother reaching for hope, because there she was stuck in the worst circumstance on earth, and she thought, maybe if I give my little kid this guy's name, he'll make it out of here. Um, it was a pr pretty, big, pretty big story. It speaks to the point of how when you're trying to solve problems on a global scale, it can be utterly daunting and often discouraging. But if you keep in mind that you're just trying to help change a single life, that, in your case anyway, has often kept you going, hasn't it? It really does. I mean, it, it, that is the grounding. I mean, you've, you have these great ambitions, but at the end of the day, are you making a difference on a one-to-one -one basis? It's a pretty good test of, of reality. And clearly you're doing something right when kids are being named after you. Oh, my goodness. One other note, Rick Barton is a former News Center political analyst. Yes, he used to come onto our newscast to help analyze local news. <laughs> there you go.